Welcome to this webinar promoted by the European Research Project, REMAP. My name is Bruno Santos and I'm an assistant professor at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. I'm also the project coordinator of this REMAP project. This webinar will be perhaps different from the webinars that we are used to attend here at Aircraft IT. We're going to talk about this research project that aims to pave the way towards the implementation of condition-based maintenance or CBM in aviation. We are going in particular to discuss the IT platform solution that we developed and we are uh, deploying at KLM facilities, one of our partners, um, to run a demonstration exercise that will illustrate our vision and our concept on the way to implement condition-based maintenance for aviation. And this is the outline for our webinar. I'll continue by giving a brief uh, presentation of the REMAP vision and concept. And I, then I'll ask my colleague Floris Freeman from KLM to share with us the airline perspective for implementing condition-based maintenance in commercial aviation. This will be followed by a, a demo of the REMAP IT platform given by the colleagues from Atos, uh, Spain. And then the two uh, following blocks will be uh, to discuss the service or the algorithms that we are deploying in this IT uh, platform. First, my colleague Anarta Roche from uh, uh, UTRC uh, Ireland is going to explain the REMAP uh, prognostics and health monitoring approach, while I'll come back to share with you the, the maintenance decision support uh, tool that we are deploying in the IT platform. I will conclude this presentation by uh, explaining to you the next steps and in this block I will also briefly uh, share with you what we are doing in terms of structural health monitoring and a data bank that we are uh, providing open for uh, development of SHM solutions. At the end we'll have time for questions uh, from your side so please save your comments uh, and uh, questions to the chat and we'll do our best at the end of this webinar to answer all your questions. So let's move on by discussing the REMAP project and the vision behind. The REMAP project stands for Real-Time Condition-Based Maintenance to Adaptive Aircraft Maintenance Planning. It is a four years uh, research and innovation action financed by the European Commission has 13 partners involved and a budget of 6.8 million euros and the coordination is done by us at the Delft University of Technology. We are currently in the last year of the project. The main goal of the REMAP project is to develop an integrated fleet management solution that aims at replacing fixed interval inspections with adaptive condition-based interventions. And to achieve this goal, we have four main technology development blocks within our REMAP project. The first one is the open IT ecosystem, which relies on the IT platform that we're going to demonstrate within a few minutes. The idea behind is that the IT platform should facilitate the collaboration between multiple stakeholders and provide service to these stakeholders or algorithms to these stakeholders, which are reliable for the implementation of condition-based maintenance. And this can only be achieved if these stakeholders share information or data in a reliable and secure way, without having to share the data among themselves. We're going to discuss this uh, later. Within the IT platform, we are deploying solutions, algorithms that can help us to predict the health condition of systems. So we are using their data-driven algorithms mainly for prognostics and health monitoring of systems. And in some cases, enhanced by physics-based uh, information or algorithms that can provide more reliable information. In a similar way for structures, we are developing data-driven probabilistic algorithms to monitor the health conditions of the structural elements. And these are fed by sensing technologies that were developed or uh, designed within the uh, REMAP projects and then used in laboratory tests to feed in these probabilistic algorithms for structures. Finally, we are also developed a maintenance uh, decision support tool to optimally schedule the maintenance interventions on a fleet of aircraft. And to the combination of these four technological blocks, 
we call the integrated fleet health management solution that we propose to implement condition-based maintenance in practice. And within this project, we are also performing a safety risk assessment of some of these uh, technologies to understand what are the implications of adopting our concept in practice. Our vision is that uh, maintenance uh, is a um, cyclical process. So mainly for systems, we are collecting information from sensors on board of the aircraft. We acquire this data, we process this data, and then we run our diagnostics and prognostics algorithms in a, um, a dynamic way, which provides information for the maintenance planning. So when to perform maintenance and which tasks have to be performed in each one of the maintenance interventions. We execute maintenance and we collect new information. Uh, we assess these processes according to the risk assessment uh, um, evaluation that I mentioned. And in the demonstration that we're going to hear about in a few minutes, we are performing all these steps except the maintenance execution and risk assessment. And this demonstration will be a six months operational demonstration, which takes place, as I said, at KLM, one of our partners. And in parallel, we are doing something similar for structures, but in that case, in a laboratory setting, using a representative structure of composite subcomponents. And as I said, our consortium is composed by 13 partners, to which I would like to thank all the, the input for this uh, webinar and all the developments within the REMAP project. And um, without further ado, I would like to give the word to my colleague uh, Floris Freeman to share with us the airline perspective on uh, CBM. Floris. Thank you, Bruno. Hello, everybody. My name is Floris. I work for KLM on condition-based maintenance. And in the next couple of minutes, I'll explain why I think that CBM is very important for future of our business. Aircraft maintenance is of course best known by its main goal, which is to keep the fleet in an airworthy state and to improve passenger comfort. But actually, aircraft maintenance is also quite important for the earning potential of the fleet. And that is because aircraft maintenance takes quite a bit of time and it's always done on the ground. So that time cannot be used to perform commercial activities like flying. Secondly, the performance of maintenance also affects the chance of a disruption. And thirdly, maintenance is costly. Maintenance cost is about 10 to 15% of total airline cost. So if we can reduce any of those three items, we would improve the earning potential of our fleet and thereby also contributing to the profitability of the airline. So this is why maintenance is important, but how does CBM come into play? Let us look at the nature of the tasks that we perform today on our aircraft. What we see is that the majority of those tasks, 80%, are not triggered on the condition of the aircraft, but instead of the age, instead on the age of the aircraft, expressed in flight cycles or flight hours. And from those tasks, about half is just an inspection that doesn't really lead to a alteration of the state of the aircraft. So by knowing the condition of the aircraft and all its components up front, we could tailor our maintenance and only execute the maintenance that is needed given the health of the aircraft. And that would save us ground time and cost. But we're not really only after those tasks that are triggered on age. We are also after those tasks that are already triggered on condition, that 20%. Because with CBM and with better prognostics, we can prolong the planning horizon of those tasks and thereby we can schedule those tasks in a more convenient maintenance opportunity. And that reduces the probability of a disruption. So that is why condition-based maintenance is important in optimizing maintenance and increasing the earning potential of the fleet. But what is holding us back? Well, there are a couple of regulatory, uh, operational, commercial, challenges, but I'm going to mention a couple of technical ones that we address in the, in the project. First of all, the, one, first, the first one has to do with data. So like any airline, we produce massive amounts of data with our flights. But given the sensitive and commercial valuable nature of that data, it's pretty difficult for us to publish that data to the outside world, unfortunately. And secondly, there are also many algorithms already available on prognostic and scheduling optimization, but for us to, to try them one by one is very time consuming because they're all quite different from each other. And third but not least, fortunately 
failures and faults are very uncommon in, in this domain. So to train an algorithm on a data-driven approach, well, we'd need to combine lots of data from multiple airlines to get enough failures. But again, airlines are quite reluctant to share their data. So we need solutions for these three challenges. What do we need? First of all, instead of centralizing and sharing the data, we could also centralize the algorithms and have those algorithms travel from airline to airline and improve each time they travel from one airline to the other. This is called federated learning, federated analytics. The second one is an easy to implement and also more importantly a secure way to quickly try prognostic and scheduling models and algorithms. Much like the app store on your cell phone, you'd like to just download a model, try it out and if you don't like it you remove it, if you like it you keep it. And thirdly to, to get there we need to speak the same language so we need a data model that is generic amongst airlines and is also available to developers of prognostic models. Good, so I've tried to explain why maintenance is important for the earning potential of the fleet and what role CBM can play in achieving a higher earning potential. I also mentioned a couple of potential solutions. So now let's look at how our WeMap partner Atos has implemented those solutions in the IT platform. Good morning, my name is Miguel Angel Esbri. I work for Atos Spain and I will be presenting shortly the uh, concept behind the Remap IT platform that we have developed in the context of a Remap project. Okay, as you can see in this uh, slide, um, the Remap IT platform concept is a distributed uh, system which is composed of two main uh, components. Uh, remap call and the airline node. The remap code uh, mission is to uh, act a central uh, component in the system which will contain uh, the different models that the modelers upload to the system and the uh, standardized catalog of uh, components. Uh, the system also works in a federated manner in the sense that uh, any airline that wishes to uh, use uh, Remap uh, platform needs to deploy on its premises the uh, airline node uh, component and afterwards federate it with the uh, uh, Remap core. Once this has been uh, done, the uh, the users or the IT staff in the airline can start downloading the different models that are available in the Remap core uh, together with the uh, components defined in the aircraft uh, catalog uh, available also in the core. Uh, also, uh, the airline node allows to uh, store the aircraft uh, data after each uh, flight and uh, Together with the models, they will be uh, processed and analyzed. Uh, as we will see in the next slides, there are uh, a few models that are available in the system. And uh, also one interesting thing is that this allows the, the airlines uh, to benefit from uh, models provided by external people, but while keeping uh, at the same time uh, um, in a private environment, the their data, because the data will never live out from the airline's uh, infrastructure. Okay, uh, concerning the data flow inside of the platform, uh, as I said, we have two different components: the remap core and the airline uh, node. The remap core is. Uh, basically managed by the remap uh, administrator who is uh, running the remap core but is also accessible uh, with different permissions by uh, model builders so the remap administrator is uh, in charge of uh, updating and uh, modifying the catalog with the different uh, air aircraft uh, components and the model builders are in charge of uh, designing their models and uh, then uploading them to the remap core. 
uh, as I also mentioned uh, previously, the the IT staff working with the airline node is able to download those uh, components from the catalog and the models that were uploaded by the modelers in the core. And uh, as we, you can see on the top of the image uh, in the airline node, uh, there are different data sources that are stored in the airline node. So we have the sensor data coming from the aircrafts, tasks that are defined by the uh, IT people in the airline, which are more related to the maintenance tasks. Then uh, it's also possible to define the workforce uh, data source, which is mainly referring to the different um, experts or technicians that they have available, and that will be used afterwards with other uh, models for um, yeah, assigning uh, staff to the repair or maintenance tasks. And of course, the the maintenance plans that can be also defined that will also use by the models to uh, try to define the best uh, options for uh, uh, maintaining the, the aircraft. So all this data uh, is available through the airline SFTP and there is an in import process that uh, takes their different uh, outputs provided by the airline and they are uh, transferred or mapped into the uh, remap database uh, on format. So once all the information is in the, in the airline node, uh, the IT staff uh, can decide uh, <coughs> to execute some of the available models, like the remaining useful life estimation model, the health indication uh, model, or the maintenance plan. But you will be able to see this uh, later in the presentation uh, carried out by our colleagues. So just to finish my presentation, I wanted to uh, show uh, a few slides uh, showcasing what uh, our colleagues from KLM will uh, later on uh, demonstrate in the live demo. So uh, typically the airline uh, aircraft when uh, it lands, uh, it has generated uh, several uh, megabytes of uh, sensor data, which is stored in CSVs. This data will be transferred into the SFTP server, which is uh, deployed together with the um, airline node in the infrastructure of the air, co air company. Uh, a second step is that uh, this data uh, available in the SFTP is uh, reviewed uh, every hour or so in the system. And when there is new data in this SFTP, the data is converted and transformed into the uh, internal um, remap uh, store using some transformation rules. OK, so and this in, in, in this in last slide, uh, uh, once the data is available in the local repository, the IT staff of, of the airline <laughs> is enabled to execute the different algorithms that are stored in the airline <clears throat> node. So uh, the IT staff can, for instance, uh, generate some prognostic or diagnostic uh, reports based on the data stored in the in the node using the, <clears throat> the models that he or she downloaded from the uh, node. But you will see this more in detail with the live demo that our colleagues from KLM uh, will uh, carry out in the next uh, presentation. And that will be everything from my side. Uh, if you have any question, we can discuss about this uh, at the end of the webinar in the uh, question and answers uh, section. Thank you very much. Okay, and we're back here. I'm showing the desktop of a KLM computer. And I'm going to show you the node. So I'm choosing here the URL of the node. It's all web-based, as you can see. And it's going to be password protected. So what I have to do here is enter my uh, username and then followed by uh, a password. So let's do that. OK, I am given um, a couple of roles here and rights, so I hope to be able to show you something interesting. But first, let's have a look at the core because I need to know whether I'm actually connected to a core and have access to the uh, to the catalog and the models. Yeah, it's looking good. 
So let's go to my fleet. Here I configured my, my fleet, so these are all my aircraft. And um, I not only configured those, but also the components that have been installed. So here there's two air cycle machines on both sides of the aircraft, and there's four air cabin air compressors. And I also, for each of these components, I configured the sensors that are installed with their uh, unit, uh, frequency, sample frequency. So this serial uh, number I have installed a year ago. Um, so that's on the wing for, uh, for a year. Um, let's have a look at the data sources. I need to tell the node where to find all the data, the relevant data. So I told it where to find sensor data for prognostics. And I also told it where to find slots uh, workforce data and all the open tasks but they are exported by our uh, uh, maintenance system to CSV in this case. So those are needed for the scheduling models. So these are all the, the this is all the data that I, I, I connected. Let's have a look at the models. So this is the model catalog. Uh, as you can see I'm already running one of those models, the air cycle machine, which uh, I made myself but um, it's also interesting to see that Onera has one uh, model available and it's called Cabin Air Compressor Remaining Useful Life Estimator. Looks interesting, so uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look what it needs. Uh, we scroll down a bit and there it shows what is the required input. So I'm having a look. I recognize these parameters because that's what I'm looking to with my aircraft. So uh, yeah, why don't we just uh, download this model and uh, give it a try. Okay, so I downloaded this model, apparently it wasn't too big. Um, so let's have a look. Yeah, indeed, I have them installed, good. Now what I need to do is uh, feed this model with the relevant subset of my data. So I need to, to provide it with a data set. So here I am supposed to create a new data set, but um, to make this video not too boring, I already did that. So uh, there it is, this is the data set that um, I made. I can show you what I actually had to enter. Um, okay, yeah, so um, the required parameters, uh, I, I had to link them to the sensor data uh, that my aircraft is logging. So for each of these parameters that the model Bionera needs, I am linking that to the physical location of my uh, sensors for this particular uh, cabin air compressor on this particular location on this particular aircraft. So, uh, yeah, I need to, uh, to make that configuration. Well, that's done. Now, uh, let's uh, have it run. There's a couple of options that we can do here. We can uh, just execute it once, but it is maybe even nicer to execute it periodically. So let's start a new execution. I can give it any name I would like to, to, to give. Um, so it asks for the model type. I'm going to tell it it is a remaining useful life estimator. The other option would have been a health indicator or a planner for a scheduling algorithm, but this is a remaining useful life estimator, of course. So I'm clicking on uh, that one. So I select the one by uh, Onera uh, and then um, I'm linking it to the aircraft that I want to test this on, on the particular uh, cabin air compressor I have configured, and then I'm linking the data set that I just made. So that's this data set. Now, I can do this like a one-off manually, but actually I want this periodically. Let's do it every 60 minutes. That would be cool to have it executed every hour. And that's really it. So this is all I need. Uh, it's going to run in 60 minutes, but I'm a bit impatient and this uh, video is uh, not that long. So let's click on run to see what, it's, uh, what, it, what it can do. So it now forces the execution of this model. It's the first time it runs it, so it might take uh, a bit of time. Not too bad. Um, okay, so it executed. Let's have a look at, uh, at my particular component uh, and see what is the, uh, the result. So I'm going to the component that I uh, am interested in, uh, which I configured, which is the inboard left cabinet compressor. This explanation mark says that there is a, indeed a diagnostic or prognostic alert. And okay, so it says that within 12 cycles, this uh, cabin air compressor might um, overheat. So that's, uh, that's not good, so I'll add a task. Um, I don't trust this model yet. I mean, I don't have experience with it, so I'm going to go for an uh, inspection instead of a replacement. Um, 
Now there's a whole bunch of items I can I can say, but let's assume that skills and materials are available. Uh, let's put the due date on next week. Yeah. And uh, the execution date, it's yet to be determined based on the maintenance opportunities, of course. So I leave that empty. Uh, okay, that looks pretty good. I'm going to save this. Now I've created a task based on prognostic output. Now the next step would be to schedule this task along with all the other tasks that are open for this aircraft and for the rest of the fleet. So one way to do that is to do that manually, but I saw that there's also a scheduling model in this catalog which I can download and test. So that model will just schedule all the, the tasks for me. I'm going to download that, but uh, um, I'm going to leave that for another demonstration. Um, because now let's talk a little bit more about the uh, individual uh, algorithms for prognostics and for, uh, for scheduling algorithm. I'm going to give the word to uh, Anarta from UTRCI now. Thanks, Boris. In the NIMAP project, one of the major focuses on development of prognosis and health management, PHM methodologies for aircraft systems and companies. Before going details into those methodologies, I'd like to give you a bit of background of aircraft maintenance. Presently, most aircraft maintenances are either preventive or reactive. In the preventive, one follows a pre-scheduled routine of maintenance tasks where asset health is not considered, and this leads to over-maintenance. In the reactive paradigm, one fixes or carries out repair tasks if something fails, and this leads to unexpected downtime and schedule interruption. Now, in the REMAP project, we are working on a third paradigm called condition-based best maintenance. Now, here in this chart, you see the full workflow of a typical uh, condition-based maintenance uh, paradigm. And in here, you see that diagnostics and prognostics analysis is one of the core focus of this CBM framework. And in the REMAP project in work package five, uh, we are working on diagnostics and prognostics and methodology development, and I'll be talking uh, some details about those methods. Before going more detail into this PHM methodology, why we are doing CBM? The CBM value addition uh, leads to many different stakeholders. One, one of the major one is that airlines, they uh, would like to have the maintenance cost reduced and better availability of the aircraft. And for somebody like equipment manufacturer or OEM, uh, continuous health monitoring, prediction of likely failures, identify root cause of failures, fleet level health management, better warranty services and strategy, understanding of environmental requirements, increase of reliability, and better insight into no fault found reports when some equipment is taken out of the data. Now, given this uh, background, let's see what are the value additions we are trying to achieve through the PHM methodology? Presently, uh, most of the PHM methodologies involve discussions with subject matter experts, SMEs. And this process is very much human centric, requires a lot of human experience and domain knowledge. And based on those uh, human factors, the PHM analytics are developed. Now, in the REMAP project, what we are trying to achieve is to automate uh, this process in order to have better scalability and reusability, and so that we can use the methodology from one system to another seamlessly. So at the core of this automation is a machine learning methodology with explainability. So the data comes from the aircraft, the machine learning models, which are trained up by the aircraft data, processes uh, those data and tries to predict failure before the failure happens, tries to quantify that health continuously, and estimate the remaining useful life of the company. Now, this is the core PHM methodology, core of the PHM methodology we are trying to develop. Now, one aspect of PHM is the result presentation or result visualization, because whatever results the PHM methodology is produced should be comprehensible to the end users in the field. So we have been also focusing on developing cutting edge visualization and representation of results. So here you see, uh, we have a methodology to visualize uh, degradation dynamics. So when you are trying to predict failure before they happen, uh, degradation signature shows up in the data before the failure and the, the degradation evolves. 
So there is a dynamics of the degradation, and here we are trying to uh, visualize that dynamics, giving better insight to the stakeholders how how the degradation is evolving, how far we are from the uh, uh, failure modes in a qualitative way. In addition, we have also developed novel uh, remaining useful life result visualization, taking all factors into account. And such visualizations are expected to facilitate better uh, maintenance scheduling because this takes care of many factors into the account. One of the major uh, thing in aircraft uh, or aerospace domain is that data is distributed geographically. The airlines fly their aircrafts all over the world. And sometimes it is difficult to bring the data to a centralized location. There may be jurisdictional restrictions, legal restrictions. So then how can we use this distributed data to train the machine learning model for the creation? So in that case, what we consider is something called cutting edge methodology called federated learning, where the models go to the data and they are separately trained with different data in different locations, and then they are brought back to a centralized location, aggregated to a single model, and then that single model uh, takes care of future PHM, and it is trained, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, it has all the characteristics, tries to uh, capture all the characteristics of the data which are distributed uh, geographically. Now, as the core of this PHM methodology is machine learning, so machine learning uh, methodology required data to train the models. So given the type of the data available, we have considered two different uh, PHM scenarios. First, the PHM scenario one, when a lot of run to failure data are available, but found run to failure. What is run to failure data? Run to failure data is the time series data taken from a, a equipment under consideration, where the first part of the data is healthy when the equipment is operating without any degradation. Then slowly degradation shows up and leads to uh, the end the failure. Uh, in this uh, scenario, the core is uh, called uh, project next methodology, uh, which is based on deep learning paradigm. It is basically an RNN based autoencoder and it is trained using uh, ground truth run to failure data and it embeds a time slice uh, of uh, the time series data, which is coming from the aircraft in a low dimensional space uh, and tries to uh, predict failure, estimate health, and uh, estimate remaining useful life. Now, if we deploy such a framework in the field, how will it look? So here I show you uh, how this thing will look uh, in the field. So data is coming from the aircraft where you see uh, is the time series, and each time slice in the data is embedded using the trajectory methodology in a two dimensional space, which is constructed through the training process. You can see three clusters healthy clusters, failure mode one and failure mode two. And you see each slice is embedded as a yellow dot. And at the beginning, as there is no degradation, the dots are embedded near the healthy region. And as the degradation evolves and shows up in the data, the healthy dogs start moving towards one of the failure uh, Similar things happen in the health index also. In the beginning, when there is no degradation, it is flat and it, start, it goes down as the degradation shows up and goes down up to the bottom when something fails. So this is uh, how we envisage uh, this uh, new method, PHA methodology can be used in the field. Uh, we validated uh, this methodology with NASA benchmark NASA PHM dataset, uh, and we got very decent result. As you can see here, uh, some of the numbers, and you can find more details about this methodology in our paper, uh, which is published in International Journal of uh, Prognostics and Health Management, where more results are there, more explanation is there. Now, this is a PHM scenario one where we need run to failure data. To train, them, to train the models. Uh, there may be scenarios that such run to failure data is not available. In a real scenario, the aircraft is just started flying. There, are not, not been lot, there has not been a lot of failures. So we don't have much run to failure data. In those scenarios, we consider a different framework and we call it PHM scenario two, where we train the core machine learning model with healthy data. So, and we also updated the TrajectNet framework to a new 
uh, deep learning based methodology, we call it PHM net. It also embeds the time slice in the time series data, which is coming from the uh, equipment semiconductor consideration. Now, if we deploy this uh, framework in the field, this is how it will look like. So in the left plot, you see the data time series data coming from an equipment or a component in the aircraft. Uh, it is evolving and the PHM net embeds this into a two dimensional space where there are small uh, uh, green dots represent the healthy. And when something fails, the embeddings move away from the healthy region. And also we see the similar characteristics in the distance from the healthy of this new, uh, of the dots here. Uh, and also the health curve uh, shows a similar deviation from the nominal operation. Now, given this deviation uh, from the nominal operation measures, uh, we can predict that something is going to fail. Now in the field, uh, there may be requirement for more insight into what is going on, why these uh, machine learning models are predicting failure, because these are black box models. And to carry out a maintenance task, we might require more insight what is going on. So we also developed explainability and root cause analysis methodologies to understand why these machine learning methodologies are predicting failure, what is going on in the system, whether we can isolate a part of the system, which is developing uh, the degradation, and then the maintenance task can focus on that part of the system. So as you can see, if you look at the, all that data, we don't know what is going on. Where is the degradation? Is it blob of, is it blob of dots and numbers? So this explainability and root cause analysis methodology gives us insight into which part of the system is uh, uh, failing or uh, degrading and uh, then the maintenance actions can be more focused on, 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 on those part of the people. Now, to summarize, uh, the advantage of these uh, methodologies over the state of the art, we don't need to monitor the individual signals data that are coming from the aircraft. You see the data is very noisy. It is very difficult to put a threshold on the data and take decisions. So we have a methodology to summarize the information into a, in, uh, in the data into a uh, lower dimensional space and using that summarized information, we can take uh, PHM decisions. Uh, we have cutting edge visualization I mentioned many times, I think. And one of the major advantage is that this is highly reusable and scalable. We can move from one system to another system uh, using this methodology within hours as long as the data is uh, As I said, requirement historical data of healthy operations, maybe just uh, Hundred flights of healthy operations. And one major requirement, this is, I don't think is only for this methodologies, these methodologies which, which were developing in the remap project. In general, if you would like to predict failure before it happens, something should show up in the data before the failure happens, which is not normal. We call it degradation signature. So that is a requirement, I think generally requirement for any PHM methodology, which it holds for our uh, PHM methodology. Now, these are the details of the PHM technology what we are working on, but how they relate to the, or uh, integrate with the maintenance system. So here I show in this chart how PHM tool uh, uh, integrates to the maintenance uh, uh, modules. So PHM in the uh, tool in the scenario two gives away the decision of failure prediction and root cause of the failure prediction to the maintenance scheduling algorithms. And this maintenance scheduling algorithm then uh, schedule optimal maintenance tasks based on many factors. And in PHM scenario one, uh, the PHM tool chain gives uh, out the remaining useful life, the health index, the failure probability, and the maintenance scheduling then use those numbers to uh, schedule optimal maintenance tasks, considering different factors like inventory status, resource uh, availability, so on and so forth. Now, in the remap project, we are also developing cutting edge novel uh, maintenance scheduling algorithms, uh, and that is done in work packet six of the remap project. And uh, Bruno will talk about that. Over to you, Bruno. Thank you. Thanks, Anartha. I'm going to explain to you now what is the maintenance planning decision support tool that we have developed and what are the algorithms that we have developed in this remap project. 
We have developed two types of algorithms, one for the long-term uh, planning of maintenance checks for a fleet of aircraft, and uh, the other is for the short term, the next weeks, to uh, allocate or reschedule open uh, maintenance tasks into a set of maintenance opportunities for each aircraft. The second one is the one that is part of the decision support tool and it is being implemented in the IT platform. But before I get into that, let me discuss with you why do we need such type of decision support tools. Well, the first reason is that it brings consistency. So having such a type of decision support tool allows the maintenance planner to schedule the maintenance uh, checks and uh, locate uh, maintenance tasks in a consistent manner. The, the second reason is that we are using optimization algorithms. So we are optimizing our maintenance uh, schedules. And according to our preliminary results, still not considering predictive maintenance tasks, we can reduce the number of maintenance checks for a, by about 8 to 10% in the long term. This is a significant amount. We can also reduce the ground time needed to perform maintenance tasks by about 90% according to our calculations, which is equivalent to almost having one extra day per year per aircraft in our fleet. So the optimization uh, can be of high relevance for the uh, maintenance uh, planning. But the need for such decision support tool is more imperative in the case that we are dealing with condition-based maintenance. Why is that? If we have a maintenance planner that is dealing with the prognostics and health monitoring information coming from one aircraft, eventually for multiple systems, this maintenance planner has to deal with this information, which is uh, probabilistic because it usually uh, deals with uh, estimations of the health uh, uh, condition of the aircraft or the remaining useful life, and has to deal with this information to produce the maintenance schedule. And this becomes even harder when this uh, maintenance planner has to consider not only one aircraft, but a fleet of aircraft with multiple components. So in Remap, we are developing a scheduling optimization framework in which we use data coming from these uh, prognostics and health monitoring solutions to generate a belief state of the health condition of its component of the fleet of the aircraft that we are uh, managing. And using optimization algorithms, we use the information from this belief state to generate adaptive plans that can be monitored and changed by the maintenance planner to something that can be published for execution. In particular, for our demonstration, we are deploying a solution that deals with the short-term replanning of open maintenance tasks. And in these maintenance tasks, we are considering predictive base tasks coming from the models that uh, my colleague Anarta presented. And these can produce remaining useful life estimations or health indicators. And we are dealing also with preventive and corrective uh, tasks, which are open, have to be allocated to these uh, maintenance uh, opportunities in the short term. We have information about these maintenance opportunities or maintenance slots in, in the future. We consider two types of maintenance slots. Uh, some are fixed uh, and already allocated to a specific uh, a tail number, to a specific aircraft. Others can be flexible and we can reallocate an aircraft uh, whenever it is needed. We have also information about costs costs uh, of performing maintenance in a corrective manner, but also in a, a predictive uh, way. And we put all this information regarding the outcomes of the predictive models, maintenance slots and costs into a prognostic task generator. And this algorithm will create this belief state that I was mentioning to uh, recommend the best dates and costs associated with these dates for each one of the prognostic tasks that we have to consider. The prognostic-based tasks and preventive and corrective tasks go all together in a pool of open tasks or tasks that we have to, to schedule. And this will be considered by the optimization algorithm together with the current schedule, so the previous schedule computed, the available maintenance uh, slots, the resources available, and eventually any limitations coming from the flight schedule.
It is important to notice that we are also considering that there will be disruptions, new information coming, that could be, for instance, for new faults uh, found in, on an aircraft, and we have to uh, schedule the new tasks based on this new information, or there could be also impact on the resources available that we have to uh, use to perform our maintenance. This information, as I said, goes into the optimization algorithms. We are considering two types of algorithms to test and compare. Uh, one, reinforcement learning, is based on a data-driven, so it's a machine learning algorithm that learns how to schedule uh, maintenance. And the other is a more traditional linear programming, which uh, consistently uh, produce uh, a maintenance schedule based on a set of constraints and uh, objectives. This, as I said, produces a, a new schedule, and this new schedule is considered as a current schedule for the next uh, time that we have to run our algorithms. In the demonstration case, we are running these algorithms every hour and comparing it with what is the solution being considered by KLM. To make it possible to read the maintenance schedules being produced here and to understand what they are the outputs from the predictive models, we are also developing a graphic user interface. This user interface will not be integrated in the IT platform for the demonstration exercise that we are talking, but will be used later on for an exercise, a demonstration exercise, in which we will involve um, maintenance planners uh, using our tools. With this user interface, the planner will be able to run the automatic planning algorithms to obtain a base plan and then be able to analyze it and adjust it according to his or her experience before publishing the schedule. The image here shows a fleet of aircraft for aircraft and what we're seeing here in green is the location of a given tail number to uh, inline maintenance and in orange to anger uh, maintenance. We also see in blue uh, the flights which are scheduled or allocated uh, to a specific tail number to have that in consideration when planning our uh, maintenance interventions. If we expand the information regarding a given tail number, we can have information about the tasks allocated to a given maintenance uh, slot. We can see in the case of this orange block that there are six um, corrective or preventive tasks associated with a given due date, which is indicated by these triangles. We also have information about prognostic tasks represented by a curve that allows the planner to visualize the best opportunity to carry out this maintenance. This curve is based on the health indicators of the components that are associated with the task. At the bottom, it's also possible to analyze the workforce available and allocated to a specific anger at any time of the day. And this will allow the planner to see if, in some cases, there is some shortage of work uh, uh, force to perform the maintenance being allocated to that slot. In a nutshell, this was the maintenance planning decision support tool that we are developing in, in the Remap. Before I move to conclusions, I would like to share with you what we are doing also in parallel regarding structural health monitoring. So partners are developing this hierarchical building block approach to generate data that can then be used to develop and test diagnostic and prognostics algorithm for uh, structural health monitoring. This hierarchical approach started with uh, using a set of uh, multiple sensing technologies like piezoelectric sensors, fiber optics and acoustic sensors, which were designed and adapted to detect, locate and measure structural damage. And we started with the tensile test coupons and we are currently testing flat multi-stiffener panels uh, representative of wing box elements. And they are being tested mainly to fatigue, uh, at impacted and artificial disbonded test articles. An important information that I'd like to share with you is that the data being generated by this unprecedented uh, test campaign involving so many sensing technologies and different levels of uh, um, panels will be made open. Actually, the level one uh, results are already open for you to access and use it in the development of structural health monitoring solutions. The link is below. You can also find this link and information on our website. Let's conclude by looking to the next steps. The demonstration exercise that we have presented in this webinar just started this week and will run until April next year. This will allow us to generate and collect information, data, 
that can be used to infer what is the impact of condition-based maintenance uh, being deployed for commercial aviation. More specifically, what is the impact of the technologies that we are developing uh, in Remap? In April or May next year, we should be back in a new webinar to discuss with you the, the results of this demonstration exercise, but also the results from the structural health monitoring testing campaign and from the safety risk assessment. Later on, we'll be hosting here in Delft the first international conference for condition-based maintenance in aerospace. You can register and participate in this conference. But on the 23rd of May, the day before the conference starts, we'll have the Remap Day. This is a free uh, event, you can participate uh, uh, if you want, and we'll share the results from Remap and uh, from this demonstration exercise and discuss a white paper towards the uh, implementation of condition-based maintenance in aviation. In the meantime, don't forget to follow us on our website and social media to know more about the project and to follow the demonstration exercise. Today, please provide comments and ask questions on the chat. I'll see you there and thank you very much for attending our webinar. Bye bye. Okay, so thank you very much for attending the, the webinar. We're going now to use um, uh, our time to answer um, some of your questions. We got many questions, so uh, perhaps we'll not have time to answer them all, but we try to answer uh, most of the questions and then the ones that we cannot address here will follow up uh, in the coming days uh, by contacting you. <clears throat> so, I will um, start with a question uh, asked um, um, by one, uh, one participant, which asks if a CBM application is successful, this may lead to even less failure data. Um, and if so, how do we envision that CBM applications and the underlying algorithms are kept valid over time? Um, we already provide an explanation, but maybe uh, my colleague Flores would like to elaborate on this. Uh, yes, sure, uh, Bruno. Um, so, a good question, of course. Um, what we expect is that if um, CBM is implemented in a larger scale, uh, we would have less disruptive failures, so fewer delays and cancellations, and fewer accelerated damage. But the faults, in principle, won't change that much because we are not changing the reliability of the components themselves. But still, it's a, it's a very valid question. Uh, because now instead of waiting for a failure to confirm that we were right, we should probably see what happens in the repair shop and assess if indeed a fault had originated after we did a um, preventive replacement. <clears throat> okay. We have also um, another, let's say, somehow a related question, uh, which is about um, um, asking the, if the project rely on the cost, uh, customized installation of sensors on the aircraft components components or does it rely on existing sensor data source available from the aircraft systems and data servers uh, maybe you'd like to start with that one because there's a second uh, question from this uh, uh, colleague uh, maybe uh, again Flores uh, or yeah Anarda. yeah so so we're using um, we're using the um... The sensors that are installed on default in the in the aircraft you could in principle also have your customized sensors installed and feed them to the platform but that's not what we're using in this project it's all all the sensors that are that are already on board and um for a modern aircraft that's uh those are plentiful and and i'm, I'm going to look at the, the the second part of the question which is to what degree uh mm -hmm. we as an airline um can configure and access the data uh, concerning the specific components, and I understand that uh, that there might be some airlines that don't have full control on that. Um, well, that that's not the case for us, at least, and I'm I'm pretty sure that most of the Boeing operators uh, have similar experience. So, by means of a so software update, you can change the the CPL parameters that you're logging, um, and you can experiment with that as well. So, um, I I can't really say about the Airbus A320, which seems to be the the scope of the of the question, um, but from what I have experience with the KLM and from what I heard from colleagues at other airlines, there is control over what uh, parameters um, you can lock. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, it's, it's uh, although uh, we with this project will not change the world, it's not, uh, uh, of course, well, that won't be our impact. But I think what we can show also with this project is uh, if uh, the concentration of uh, data uh, to one single stakeholder, if that's the best option uh, for the sake of uh, um, uh, uh, the, the aviation uh, uh, yeah, efficiency and safety. So we believe that distributing data in a safe uh, or in a secure way uh, will benefit more. And that's what we are uh, seeing with this project. Um, and Arta, I don't know if you want to uh, address also this question and with different perspective or should it? Yes. Yeah, so uh, for distributed nature of the data, as I mentioned, uh, we are also looking into something called federated learning, uh, where uh, the PHM algorithms or the models are sent to the data instead of data being fetched uh, into a centralized location. So there are uh, new technologies and algorithms are being developed to address uh, this distributed nature of the data, uh, different ownership of the data. Yeah. yeah. Good. So I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you, Narta, and I'll ask uh, one of one uh, another question that we have in the chat. Does the remaining use for life estimator uses the <clears throat> MPBUR uh, data from the components? Uh, at this point, uh, we are only using the data collected from the aircraft. Uh, the other external data uh, we might use in the future, but at this point, it is all the algorithms only based on the data collected from the aircrafts, the PHM algorithms. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm going to add on that, uh, yeah. because the, the installation date of the components are in the are configured in the platform. So if a model developer wants to use the yeah. H as well, then they could. And actually, from TU Delft, there is a model currently uh, that is running at KLM that is using that is doing just that. So that's also using H in addition okay. to the sensor data. Hmm. Okay, a following question, uh, <clears throat> maybe for uh, Floris. Um, the, the colleague says you are just showing that uh, you can execute a task out of the prognostic uh, node system. Where will this uh, be transferred to and in which format uh, to which system? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, in an ideal world, that will be pushed to our maintenance uh, system and, and show up as a regular task or or as a as some kind of an order or a maintenance support order. but. Um, unfortunately, in the scope of this project, that's not there. So if you want to use this this task, you would at this point have to manually uh, copy it to the maintenance system to get it done. But um, that's uh, work for uh, that's that's future work. Yeah. Okay, and we have uh, many uh, other questions popping in. Um, let me move to another one. Um, so there's a colleague that questions, uh, you show uh, planning uh, with flights, workforce uh, available and tasks related to prognostics in remaining useful life. Or are you also taking into account other inputs such as um, uh, working, um, um, WOs working, uh, coming from maintenance program, uh, working package, uh, presume, but uh, working orders. Uh, uh, mechanic, uh, mechanic specific skills, ground support equipment that will impact planning, and also, uh, uh, yeah, let's go with this one, otherwise it gets too long. Uh, Flores, do you, you want to start with this one? Uh, yeah, and, and if I understand the question correctly, then uh, the question is whether we have task attributes, like what are the requirement skills, what are the requirement tools and material, etc. Yes. So um, indeed, and those are those are contained in the in the task uh, files. So as an airline, you would push this data to the platform, and uh, then the algorithm within the platform can match the 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 skills, for example, with the available skills that are contained in the in another push. So um, you would make sure that the task can only be executed when there is sufficient uh, uh, labor and resources available. So for material at this point, uh, material and tools, uh, that would be a manual uh, push. That uh, that will be actually a manual configuration by the user of the platform that would have to uh, put into the system when the material is going to be available. Mm. Including the work uh, orders coming from maintenance program, correct? You can include those tasks as being yeah. part of yeah, this. Yeah, 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 sure, definitely, yeah. 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 Um, Another question, can the 
and maybe to um, Ivan, uh, can the airline push own models to the remap core? So um, I presume models owned by the airline. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, any any model builder, uh, any user registered as a model builder in the in the airline core uh, can push uh, can upload the their models to the to the remap core. Uh, and, and once uh, once a model is uh, some model is uh, published in this uh, rim of core, uh, any airline can uh, any airline can uh, can check the catalog and, and download any 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 model that, uh, that it uh, wishes and that it and that the, it considers uh, applicable to their to their specific uh, fleet configuration. Actually, for this uh, demonstration ex exercise. Uh, we have some uh, we have some uh, some uh, models that we are using for for testing for integration testing uh, developed by by KLM as well. So so yeah, this is a uh, is of course uh, an option. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Another question: uh, If the aircraft data is specific airline uh, is specific airline folder. How do you do uh, verify the good behavior of the algorithms to their fleets? Uh, how the federated mechanics restore the algorithm uh, or upgrade the algorithm? Um, Floris um, or Anarta, would you like to address this? Maybe Floris to start. I'm putting the questions in our priority uh, folder. Ah, OK, OK. Uh... Uh, yeah, so uh, in the federated mechanism, there are ways to uh, distribute the model into different data and uh, we there are validation methodologies in that paradigm uh, to test the performance with different fleet uh, uh, data so there are uh, technologies in the federated learning and federated uh, kind of training methodologies uh, to achieve that uh, i mean this uh, maybe uh, presentation is not the right forum, but if you if you uh, Google search uh, federated learning and validation of methodologies in federated learning paradigm, uh, you can find details about how we, how this, these are done. Yep. We have uh, one model running uh, with federated learning uh, yeah. uh, currently in the colleagues. It's from University of Coimbra. The colleagues are uh, using some uh, uh, weighted methods to uh, yeah. to. Uh, uh, consider the uh, calibration happening at different nodes. In their case, what they are testing now, different nodes are different aircraft, and they are testing how this could then improve the overall efficiency of the method by testing different versions of the algorithm at different aircraft. And they're using a kind of weighted uh, um, method. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, you see what we have more here. Um, there is uh, here a question. Um, let me see. How do you envisage this uh, uh, working uh, alongside uh, the regular uh, approved maintenance uh, program? Uh, maybe Floris. Yeah. So for this this demo, uh, we're we're not we we cannot substitute those those tasks obviously. So they they would still run alongside the platform. But actually, the platform also reads those tasks and 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 use them and can schedule them, All right? So if there's a if there's a task from the maintenance program, then we're not to to change its uh, its due date or its interval um, or even substitute it. That's of course not allowed. Um, but we would use that task in addition to all the other tasks to compute the most optim optimal optimal uh, maintenance schedule. Okay. And, and of course, the, um, the all the prognostic tasks on on these systems, we can do that uh, uh, ourselves. Of course, these are all yes. economic tasks that we can uh, execute at any time. Yeah. Another question is um, a colleague that says, well, that he uh, here he, he sees the the project like Skywise from Airbus. Uh, he refers specific, specifically to the aim uh, to collect data and provide the recommendations. So I presume more of the question is uh, how different uh, it is. Um, eventually, the, the concept could be uh, the same, and this comes from the re the reason that we explained in the, during the, the video that um, we need data from more than one operators to develop reliable 
uh, prognostic algorithms. But uh, the project goes beyond that um, uh, that structure, that element, that philosophy, followed also by Skywise, uh, in a, in a two aspects or three aspects actually. One which is a parallel one, which is that we are uh, aiming, uh, at least considering how this could work, also for structural uh, health monitoring. Um, which is not necessarily something completely different from Skywise, but we are doing that. The second thing is uh, that we have a completely open platform. So the idea is that uh, anyone could um, um, upload um, um, a solution, so uh, an algorithm to the platform that can be used by any uh, partner that um, would like to implement uh, condition-based maintenance during in their maintenance operations. So it's completely open, uh, the, the, the platform for any stakeholder to benefit from it. And uh, the third um, uh, third difference, at least to, to the best of my knowledge, is that we also have this uh, scaling component uh, at the end, so uh, treating the information from uh, uh, prognostics uh, to produce a fleet, uh, overall a fleet uh, maintenance uh, plan. Um, um, there's also another question which I'll pick up. Uh, what, what is the long-term roadmap for this project? Will this turn into a commercial viable software? That's a, a, a good question. Um, so we are now in the phase of um, um, discussing the, the, the business model after a remap. Um, it is, as I said, uh, an open platform, the one that we have shown here. So uh, if it will be a business model, it will be in a, in a format that will be an open platform to be used by uh, partners. Um, but we would like to uh, further extend the research that we are doing here to make it uh, a commercial uh, software, um, if not in the short term after remap, at least in, in the long term. And um, the roadmap of the, the, the project is not only the technologies that we are developing and some of them we presented here in this uh, webinar, but also to discuss what are the implications, limitations and opportunities uh, for implementing condition-based maintenance uh, in practice. And one of our final deliverables will be a discussion of a, a white paper on, um, on, on, on these opportunities and challenges for condition-based maintenance in the future. And um, um, let me see. So we do have an, another question here. How do you collect the data for training the CBM models? How many models components are currently covered in the catalog? Um, maybe Ivan or uh, Floris? Oh, Worrying on the time. So perhaps I can I can start with the uh, with how we're capturing the data and and for this you can you can expand with the with the current uh, status of the catalog, if you wish. So uh, so for uh, capturing the the data to for for importing data into into each of the nodes uh, in the platform, uh, we do we do have a, we do have a, define a, a connector. Uh, uh, right now, for the for the demonstration phase, uh, we have implemented a, an SFTP uh, connector, where the where the, the the node administrator can can configure uh, the different folders, uh, the different folder structure uh, where they are uh, storing their, their data, and and for each of these uh, for each of these uh, folders, they need to define uh, the mapping of uh, of this data into uh, corresponding with the with the catalog of components so the so the platform can adapt uh, airline uh, specific uh, sensor data into the standardized uh, remap uh, remap uh, that data format uh, so i said i said uh, this is the the approach for the demonstration uh, but uh, of course uh, this uh, this module has uh, the, the node actually has been uh, developing a a real uh, modular way, so so we envision in the future to to be able to, to of course uh, expand uh, this module to uh, to be able to support uh, additional uh, additional uh, possibilities for for uh, feeding data into the to the node. Right now we we went with uh, SFTP since it's a 
very flexible, uh, very easy to integrate the uh, way, but uh, in the future, this could be expanded. So in Flores, you can complement with the, regarding the, the catalog, the size yeah. of the catalog. Sure. On the 787, we have about seven, seven systems. Um, and at least seven models, depending on how many of the partners develop models for those systems. And on the 737, we have currently one, the PDAR system, but that is composing of multiple subsystems. So um, yeah, between eight and 12 systems we have currently, let's say. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, we we'll have to close it here. We are already over time. There are still questions to be answered in the chats, which I really appreciate the, the input and the, the interest from everyone. We'll address those questions, so we'll uh, uh, approach you with uh, the uh, with uh, the answers. Um, if you stay in the webinar, uh, maybe you can reply some of these uh, here in the chat. Otherwise, we'll uh, um, we'll get in contact with you uh, next week with uh, with our answer to your questions. As I said, we'll close it here. I thank you once more all for being present. I I will uh, also thank my uh, colleagues for their contribution and input for this webinar. And I wish you all uh, a good day, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Stay in touch.